transmitted during the session to avoid uh, interruptions. And also, please note down your questions and concerns during the session so that they'll be reverted to at the end of the session. So the, the, the webinar is also being recorded and it will be shared on our social media platforms for your access later on. So I now, I now would like to invite David. So welcome, David. Thank you so much, everyone. So first, thank you so much, everyone, for coming in and joining our series today. So this is the, first, the fourth discussion that we are having. And our focus is on health communication, the what, why, and how to make that communication effective for it to achieve its goals. So we learned, we'll have to start from the what is health communication, the why we need the health communication bit, and how to make it be effective to ensure it's achieving its intended goal. So as before we get started into the main discussion, there's a poll that I have for us. So I'm going to ask if you guys, maybe Hezron, can you access the poll? With this a poll that we have. I can't see it right now. Okay. Just a moment, let me have it. Okay. Okay, I think now we can have access to it. Well, it's well, it's not, it's not still not coming up. So yeah, I, maybe I could just look into it again. It has refused saying the polling session is inactive. So we'll just have to move into the discussion as we intended to, but I'll bring up some of the questions that we had for the poll. And these are the ones. So do you think as an individual that you have a responsibility when it comes to health communication? Maybe you could use the chat box for that. Why, yes and a no, why for yes and N for a no. Do you think you have a role in health communication? Let's get our chat box active. Mm -hmm, we have two out of the 10. Do you think you have a role in health communication? Perfect, we have a number. There's nobody who thinks they are not involved in health communication or they don't have a role in it. So that's interesting. Then the second question, are you involved in health communication in any way? As an individual, as a professional, if you're practicing somewhere, do, are you playing your role in health communication if you think you have a role in it? So are you involved? Are you doing something about health communication? That would be the second question. So maybe you could type in again the why and the no. Perfect. So it, like we're having people who are informed about what we are doing. Bran doesn't think he's playing his role. We look at it and see what role you can play in health communication, how you can play it better, and what it has for the society and for you as an individual in terms of advancing our agenda for access to, quali access to quality healthcare services, which are available and affordable to everyone who needs them. So to get us started, we want to look at it in terms of what's health communication. Health communications come from the two terms, health and communication. And we know that communication is the transfer of information from one person to another, which is focused on relaying that, that information. For example, now we are talking, I'm presenting in this session, and you are listening to it. So the intended audience, the target audience is the participants, which includes all of you who are in the chat room, in the meeting room today, and then I'm the person relaying that information. If you're getting to hear what I'm saying and understanding the main message behind it, then that's a communication. You can give me feedback on the same. Like for now, we had our initial feedback session where I was asking on whether you know you, you feel you have a role in health communication and whether you're playing that part in terms of ensuring people have access to 
health information as they need to and with their varied responses. So the, your response is kind of feedback to me in that communication arrangement. So according to the CDC, health communication is the study and use of communication strategies to inform and influence individual decisions that enhance health. So they are aimed at informing and influencing individual decisions towards enhancing health. So when we look at it in terms of communication, there is an expected outcome that is to enhance health. Then it involves use of communication strategies. How are we, which strategy are we using at this point? We have a webinar series, the Health Roundup that we have, which is aimed at giving people access to information that is giving them ways they can solve the issues that are affecting our healthcare systems. So this is our platform and it's a strategy that we believe everybody needs access to that information. If we can have up to 100 people attend a session and every other person who can watch it on the Facebook Live that we have, that is a strategy to ensure we have a number of people seeing that information and then they contextualize it for them to be able to apply that knowledge. When they're able to apply it, it means they'll either communicate the right information, the factual evidence-based facts that's going to guide someone to make the right decision in their lives. If there are people in the medical sector who are practicing, they know the value of that communication that they relay out and that information they'll now relay after the insights that they've gained from these discussions will be impacting the health of other individuals. It will enhance their health as an individual and the health of the community where they have a responsibility. So we have to look at it in terms of why are we doing it? The main reason behind it. Then what information are we conveying? Then how do we convey it to ensure it achieves its intended outcome without being watered down along the way? And then we realize that health communication, it has gained prominence in the recent past. And most of it started when there was the acknowledgement and adoption in the US Bill of Rights under the Health, 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 health People 2020 objectives, which ensure that there was a component of health communication that was in the United States of America to ensure that health communication was being given priority. And it means if you go seek care from a healthcare practitioner or a professional at a particular point, it's their responsibility to give you the health information that you need. For example, if I'm managing a diabetic patient in my pharmacy, I need to let them know about the preventive measures, the health promotion factors, the feeding dietary counseling that they need to ensure they live a healthy life, and any other associated factors behind that health communication. So it's not only a matter of giving them the information on this is your medicines, you need to use them. Let's say, for example, it's metformin. You have to take the 500 milligrams twice a day, one in the morning, one in the evening. That is it. But it's not the main thing that we're looking at because for people to live healthy lives, we don't need to wait for them to be sick for us to respond. So it means our communication strategy will be coming from what do we need to ensure they are catered for? That we look for, the pre we pr promote health, prevent disease, when they're sick, we ensure they have access to the quality care and the right information to ensure their management protocol is being adhered to and they're getting the best outcomes out of it. For example, when Andred mentioned she's a psychologist, if you're dealing with clients who are visiting your clinic or your practice, practice site facility, then you have to give them the information and you have to see that they're applying the insight that they're gaining from your counsel session. So if they're able to apply that knowledge, that is a win for you. And that is the main critical point when we're looking at it in terms of your health communication strategy as a professional. Then before we are professionals, we are members of the society, we are members of the community, and that role that we play at a professional level has an impact on how the society is, whether it's going to be healthy or not going to be healthy. So that is a common comp component. However, that's, there's just a, dis a disclaimer that I want to give you here. When health communication gains prominence, as I've mentioned, the focus was on the preventive promotion and the key promotion and quality of life, disease prevention, health promotion and quality of life, lifestyle factors, behavior change and all that. But we have to acknowledge that it was these factors that were coming in, but they are not the only things. It's just a matter of they were neglected earlier because we realized that most of our focus on health was ensuring an individual can get the care they need. And therefore there was communication already happening. But the disease prevention and health promotion were not factored as much. And there was a realization that if we've been communicating just to respond to, the, to a disease or an infirmity at some point, then what if we channeled our communication and our response to disease and health states from the preventive and the promotive component? 
Therefore, it means you won't need to have people who are sick who can't access care because you are communicating between patient and the doctor in a sickness in a health facility where there's a sickness that needs to be cured. And therefore, it's at the end of the spectrum. If we did it earlier, we wouldn't have to get to that point. And another thing we realize, most of the diseases that arise, some are preventable. And when they are sick, people are sick, we have limited resources. A constraint of resources exists in every other country and in every other place. So because of that constraints in resources, it's imperative that we prevent diseases so that we don't have overburdened health facilities where we'll be having the communication happening, but it's not achieving its intended outcome. Because if you come to my pharmacy, I want to give you medicines to treat you and get, make you get better, but I don't have the medicines. The communication only will not help you. But if I prevented you from getting sick in the first place, I'll have achieved the ultimate goal because you won't be coming to get medicines. You'll be coming for counsel on how to improve your lifestyle and modification of the dietary measures and all that. So that will be a win. And those were the factors that came into the initial health communication bill that was introduced in the US Congress in 2010. So there are recent development that now factor environmental issues. That's why you look at it when people are talking about climate change. And we have to acknowledge that climate change has an impact on how our health is. And that is what's causing even, for example, we look, we look at it in terms of the One Health approach. There are issues on wildlife. It, with the wild, wildlife encroachment areas by human beings, when you're doing agricultural practices, there's the human-animal conflict that arises. And these are some of the things that are contributing to the nosocomial, not the nosocomial, nosocomial in the hospital setup. We are talking about the infections from animals. So such, such kind of factors are going to affect us. And those are things that we have to look at how to prevent. So those are very critical as well. Then the social issues, behavior change, we have social problems that are rising because of the economic constraints and related people having social problems, psychological issues. These, these are things that are happening in our environment, how we relate with others and how we respond to stresses in our environment. These have a role to play. Then additionally, we have it, communication serving in two approaches. For me to communicate to you and for, for you to understand what I'm saying, we have to look at it as an instrument that is just transferring knowledge from one person to the other. Then there is the ritualistic function of communication. There is a way that I believe in someone that they might be speaking to another party who is not even me, but because of my relationship with to them and because of my affiliation to what they are saying, I'll take up that information even if it wasn't intended for me. And two, certain times information is being relayed. It might be relayed to you or to me at a particular situation or incidence, but the way I perceive that information, the way I'm going to apply it depends on my take on that inform that person. It depends on my take about that particular matter. For example, you can realize in the recent past, we've had debates in the parliament about comprehensive sexuality education. When we're talking about issues on comprehensive sexuality education, there are a group of people who are opposed to the whole idea. Reason, there is a social design and how, social perception about issues on sexuality that nobody wants to talk about them. Nobody wants to endorse them. And why is that? Because we have a societal contract and the societal kind of perception on what needs to be and what doesn't need to be. So when that happens, even if something is good for us, we are not going to adopt it. And if we don't adopt it, if it's supposed to improve health outcomes, it would definitely will not improve the health outcomes because it's something that we're not adopting. So those are some of the critical things that we have to look at as well. So when we look at the different components, as an instrument of health, Health communication as an instrumental factor or as a ritualistic factor will have two different aspects. As an instrumental factor, we look at the channels of communication. What media are you using to relay that information? We have a Zoom for the webinars and all. Some other people will be using Microsoft Teams, all the online medium. We have media channels, the stations, the radio station that we have in place, one-on-one -on -one -on -one discussions. Let's say, for example, the politicians and influencers because they have the public forums, the rallies, and all that they organize. When we look at churches, those are channels that we can use to get an audience, and then we relay the information to them. Who is the source of that information? As I alluded to earlier, my perception and my take on a particular matter that is being spoken on, communicated to me, will be depending on the source of that information. If it's someone I trust, I'll take that information for a fact and apply it in my 
environment and everything that I'm going to do. If I don't trust them, I'm not going to apply. If I trust them partially, there are some parts of it that I'll use, the other parts that I'll let go. So the source of that information also matters. Then there is the receiver, the recipient. You have an individual bias towards that information that is being related to that subject matter. You won't be interested in listening to it or getting that fact right. So that's going to affect you. And how you decode that information. Once you receive it, some of the times we have the decoder bias, the receiver bias, where you use your previous experiences to know how to act on a particular information. And because of that previous experience, it might not have served you right, but it's what's going to take precedence and control how you respond. So whether right or wrong, the outcome might not be the intended one. So that is something that we have to factor as well. Then the actual message that is being communicated. If the message that is being communicated is clear, concise, and factual, it's something that's reliable, it will achieve its goal. If it's a message that is distorted already, and that is where we have issues with fake news, because if I'm going to create any material that's not serving a purpose, it will influence the society because there's a source, there is a channel that has been used, and people are receiving that communication. But what is the content? The content is already biased, and that's going to affect us as consumers of that information and the entire society. And if you can remember, there are a number of people we had our session with on the bonfire charts that was on Friday. When we're talking about issues on teen pregnancies and all, we have to acknowledge that the message, if it is distorted, is going to affect us. And people are talking about this kind of content that we're having in our mainstream media. We have kind of sexually motivated videos and all that music content. If that's going to our people, then it's going to influence how the society thinks how our society perceives such kind of advances, and then it's going to influence how we react to it and how we adopt or don't fail to adopt it. So the content of that message and how it's packaged to get to the recipient will have an influence on the outcome. Then in the real ritualistic realm, we are considering it in terms of what are the features of these individuals. We are individual human beings who are social human beings. We have our networks. We have our friendships and we interact with people within those networks. And if we interact with people, there's some kind of level of trust that comes in our relationships. For example, when someone looks at, for example, if we have, let's say, in a family setup, whatever it is that a mother or the father will say to the kids, most definitely it always becomes a gospel truth when the kids are young. It's the actual thing that they come to believe. So in that network, if you communicate the right thing through the influencers in that family arrangement, you've made your target to do it the way you want it to be done. Otherwise, you'll have lost out. So those are some other critical things as well. Then also, the way we derive meaning from the information that we get is based on our surrounding our environment and the people we think want to believe or we don't want to believe, as I mentioned earlier. So there is the human, the social component of that communication, and there is the objective not the subjective bit but it's the objective we are looking at channel source receiver the objective bit but it comes us to have the subjective component where we have the realistic considerations in place humans are social beings in social networks and they are deriving their meaning that they get from that communication is influenced by who is communicating that same content so those are some of the very critical things that we need to look at as well so that marks the first bit of getting to know what is the background of health communication and what do we need to do. Then moving to the other types of communication, we have persuasive and behavioral communication, which is the mainstay at the current moment and the main focus, where we tell you, you have to do physical activity, you have to feed healthy, a number of things, you have to put on your mask, social distancing around COVID-19. These are persuasive and behavioral communication then there's other risk communication where we're telling you unprotected sexual intercourse will lead to risk of preg unwanted pregnancies. There's the risk of STIs, and those are risk communication. And even in COVID now, you're being told, if you don't adhere to the different safety protocols that are being uh, rolled out by the ministry and the public health authorities, you're at risk of getting infected. And when you're infected with COVID, there is a risk that you might get to be in the severe complication form of COVID-19. So you have to put in place measures to avoid being infected. We are communicating the risk that is attributed to it. Then there is the media advocacy. 
And that's something that has been in the mainstay where we see on um, television, the radio stations and all that, how inviting guests or even guests making proposals to be hosted in these forums to discuss different health issues. And when they discuss them, it depends with the audience. Majorly to the public, it's to enlighten the public and bring out pertinent issues that need to be solved. In other cases, it's a matter of influencing policy and we have to use the media because the media has the people. If the media has the people, we talk, the, talk to the public about the issues that are affecting them, then there is a chance the receptiveness of the community towards that particular agenda is higher. Therefore, policymakers, uh, being they have the political inclination, would want to serve the interests of their people, which is the public. That is another component. Then we have entertainment education. You are entertained, but at the same time, you are getting to receive the health communication, the health message that is being passed through. If you guys can acknowledge there is this Chukwa selfie song that was released by a number of musicians. In the outset of COVID-19, April, there was a fund that was launched by the president himself so that the artists and all that, the musicians can create content to educate the public and enlighten them on issues around COVID-19 and the risk factors. So you're using entertainment because people are drawn towards the entertainment bit, the jovial life and all that. So when you're entertained and you're getting the right information through that medium, it's achieving its goal. Then you have the interactive health communication. When you talk about interactive health communication, most of it has been in the healthcare setting. Patient doctor, doctor doctor, healthcare worker and another healthcare worker, the multidisciplinary component of care. Then additionally, we are now in that interactive health communication, we have that component of healthcare practitioners interacting with medical representatives, the pharma companies, the drug manufacturers and all that. That is also interactive health communication where there is the discussion between one party to the other towards getting a common ground on better improving the healthcare outcomes. Then there's development communication and participatory communication. You have an issue that is affecting a community. You engage with that particular community. And once you engage with that community, you're looking at them developing a solution to where their existing problems. For example, there is a discussion that I saw that's happening in Mombasa now. Drug, drug and substance abuse has been a mainstay in the coastal region. And because of that, there are different forums that are being created for the young people and the community at large to find solutions to their problems. And when they're finding these solutions, they're coming up, for example, with social hubs where the, the young people who normally would spend most of their time in kind of hideouts where they get exposed to drugs and all, come into these social community hubs. When they get to the community hubs, they get engaged. They do something that's meaningful. The time they would have rather spent looking for drugs or getting introduced to drugs is not there because this is now a solution that is being developed from the community level. So it's a participatory agenda. We want a healthy society. How do we create it? And where is, where is the problem? Once we know the problem, engage the community where it exists, find solutions from them, and develop a common solution. And that solution will be adopted by them. And that is where we have the development communication or participatory communication to achieve its intended outcome. Then finally, because this, I'm, I had an asterisk on the scientific communication because in the health communication agenda, it hasn't been given as much attention as it deserves, but it's something that needs to be looked into as well. All the medical interventions that are being delivered, if we talk about having pharmacists in the room, we have medical doctors, we have nurses, we have psychologists, and any other person who is in the house, there is a science behind everything that we do. Because I know you have either been sick, if you're not sick, there's a point that you are killed and you are vaccinated. That vaccine is a product of science. So anything that you've ever used, a medicine or a chemical that has ever been introduced to you is a product of science. So how do we communicate the scientific facts that are coming behind it? And that is where we have a challenge. And especially at this point in time with COVID-19, where so many companies are coming up, finding, so trying to find solutions to COVID by getting vaccines, therapies, and all, the translation of those evidence that they develop from the labs, from their research work, into actual implementable science in terms of clinical practice, giving people the right medicines, and beyond that, ensuring that the community is willing to take up those services. Because if we have a drug and nobody wants to use it, it won't have served its purpose. So the scientific communication is very key and it should be evidence-based and factual information, it should be reliable. And that is something that we have to acknowledge in the recent past as well. We've had challenges. 
because there have been rumors around people, pharmaceutical companies influencing the research. And when they influence research, it means the facts will be cooked. And when facts are cooked, the ultimate result is the drug might not be able to do what it's perceived to do or what it's reported to be doing. Every other person who uses that product is at risk. And those are things that we have to avoid. But not everybody has the facts. I don't have the facts. I don't work for the pharma company. I'm not part of the research team. But at the end of the day, we have a responsibility to question and to seek more information. How did we come up with these facts? How did we get to these conclusions? And what is the evidence behind it? If we are able to do that, we'll be at a far much better place. So those are some of the things that we have to look into in scientific communication. And that fact is very, very important. And the audience as well is very key. Because if, for example, there's a trusted pharma company that comes out and flaunts their product as a keyword, then everybody in the public will want to use that product. What if it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing? And the way we communicate it is very critical. And that's why when you look at it in terms of the pharma marketing as a pharmacist, pharmaceutical marketing is directed towards healthcare practitioners. That is for not over-the-counter products. Anything that's not over-the-counter, it should be targeted to healthcare practitioners who will determine based on their professional judgment to know whether you really need that product or you don't need it. And that is key. But if, for example, I tell you about a steroid that is curing individuals about against COVID, every member of the public will want that drug. You have to question the credibility of that information, one. Two, when you look at it in terms of a steroid or any other drug, they have side effects and adverse events that arise from them. So if it's not indicated for you, what if it has the complications and this person loses their lives? Who is to be held accountable in that such a circumstance? So those are some of the things that we have to factor in our communication. And that's why I made it clear that scientific communication is key. However much, not every other person in the public is involved in it. We need to get involved. You won't have the facts. You won't have the basis for the findings. But you can question, why are you reporting the facts of your research to the general public, yet according to provision, it should be to healthcare practitioners? Then who are you, what authority do you have? Because as we all know, human beings are self-centered. Whether they are serving a societal need, they have their own inherent needs that they're serving. So if someone comes to tell you something is perfectly good for you, you need to look at it in terms of what is in it for them. If a pharma company comes to advertise one of their products as the best in the market, Definitely, it's supposed to influence the sales. If it is influencing sales, they get even, there are more profits from more sales, more profits, and the bottom line is perfect for them. So those are some of the things that we have to get to a point that we are questioning. Why do you want to communicate it to us? And that is a question that I ask myself when there's this viral video clip that came out of a doctor who was talking about the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine and all that. If she's blaming every other findings that are coming out to be already influenced by pharma industry, what, do we, what confidence should we have in her to show that she's not influenced? And then she didn't report those kind of facts. So those are very, very critical things that we need to ask. So the word of health communication. You need to know what message do you want to relay? Is it scientific and research findings? If it is a scientific and research findings, there are protocols on how you record, report that. There are peer-reviewed journals and all. They have to go through the proper channels, who, which are reviewed by experts and professionals in the field to ensure that that communication that is being relayed out to the public for use or even to healthcare practitioners meets the standard of being a scientific finding. It meets the threshold that is required of it. The other kind of health communication that we can have is the care protocols that are released. For example, the treatment guidelines. If we have a treatment guidelines, it is answered by the scientific and research findings forming a basis for it, the need in that community, and the ability to afford that care. And that is why you find treatment guidelines vary from one country to another, depending on availability of the drugs, the cost factor, and even the efficacy in terms of the different demographics. A drug can work for one person and not work for another because of the different physiological differences that we have as individuals. So those are very cre critical as well. Then there are issues on policy and regulatory guidelines. How do we have the policy and regulatory guidelines being communicated? Who needs to get to know the information? As the public, we have a right to know about the policy interventions and even laws that are guiding different issues. And that was the first discussion that we had on the health amendments bill when we started the health roundup sessions. 
So you have to look into these matters and see how do we make it be something that needs to be addressed and how do we be part of the policy intervention so that if a policy is not meeting its need, we can respond to it. Like we're talking about the comprehensive sexuality education bill. That is something that needs to be addressed. But how do we want to influence it? Based on our biased judgment, whether it's cultural, it's religious or anything, or because of the need that we have as a society with teen pregnancies on the rise, sexually transmitted infections on the rise, and there's nobody that's censoring the information that's getting to every other person, in even increasing the risk further. So those are some of the things. The social behavior change. If we have a, an increasing burden of non-communicable diseases, these include cardiovascular diseases, diabetes is there, we have cancers and all. Social behavior change, we need to start from what are the contributing factors, what are the predisposing factors. We address the predisposing factors. Once we address them, then people start changing their behavior. The burden of these diseases will reduce. The people who are sick, we ensure that they change their lifestyle and even the data modification and all that. And once they've done that, we move into ensuring we manage them to ensure they are compliant on their medicine and get better health outcomes out of it. Then health advice and patient information. You need to communicate health information to your patient, for example, the healthcare practitioners who are in the house. You need to communicate to them and get to understand what they are going through. They relay their information on their symptoms and everything to you, and you make a professional judgment based on science, that is the knowledge you have, the technical knowledge, have a judgment in terms of what they feel and other contributing factors. For example, as a pharmacist, this is one thing that we normally look at. I won't give you a drug that you need to take four times in a day when I know you are a casual worker who will have to be in the field almost every other time you are out in the, in the field. Chances of you taking a midday dose is almost zero, meaning compliance will be a problem. If you can't comply to your medicines, you won't get cured. So there's no need for me to give you such a drug. I'll have to look for alternatives. So the health advice has to factor in the patient variability, the patient factors, and then the clinical knowledge behind it, and ensure it achieves the optimal health outcomes. In terms of patient information, it can be patient information within the same hospital. For example, one consultant transferring a patient to another within the hospital, or one hospital in the referral system, if you understand the Kenyan referral health system, we have the community health, we have the dispensary, we have the health centers, moving to level three health sub-county hospitals, up to the tertiary hospital, the national hospital, that is the group of Kenyatta National Hospital, KU Teaching and Referral, MOI. So if that whole cascade happens, it means if a patient was managed in a dispensary in Busi or Kakamega, that information should be cascaded up the chain such that in case they're referred to Kenyatta National Hospital, already the doctor seeing them has the right information and can make a judgment based on how they've been managed. If that doesn't happen, it's going to affect the quality of care of the patient. It's going to ensure delay the care. For example, if we have to do a number of tests, yet there were tests that were already done, it would have helped to rule out a number of tests that can be done. So with ruled out tests, we have lesser tests to perform, easier management of the patient, better outcomes. And those are some of the things that we need to look at. How do we ensure this communication is happening the best way it needs to happen? And which problem is it solving? So which problem are we solving? That is with the initial information. What are we going to communicate? There's a problem. This is the ultimate solution to it. Then once we know the solution, we need to communicate it. So why do we need to communicate it? For scientific and research finding, to advise care and health intervention, a number of these I've mentioned as well in the discussion on the what. So the why will be based on what you need to communicate. Why do you need it? But it's, it's the other way around, because once you know the problem, you're giving the communication aligned to why you want to, what you need to change. So policy and regulatory guidelines to inform and provide legal basis, and that's other than the legal basis to ensure they are responsive to the needs of the society. To influence human behavior, that the social behavior change. Health advice, patient information, fostering patient responsibility and self-care, and improving treatment outcomes. In self-care, we talk about it in terms of you as an individual taking your medicines when you're sick. And other than you taking your medicines when you're sick, you also have a responsibility to give the actual information of what you're suffering from when you're seeing a doctor. And when you've given that information, you, need, you have the right to seek clarification. If I'm giving you one drug over another, drug A instead of drug B, you need to question why I think that is the best drug. What condition am I treating you for? 
Because I remember when we started with culture, that was in 2017, November, there was a discussion I had with a friend. And this, is, this was their narration. I went to, a host, to the hospital, I saw the clinician at that point. They reviewed me, listened to my case, wrote a note for me and gave me drugs without even telling you what condition you're being treated for and why they think that is the condition you're being treated for and whether the drugs are good for you or not good for you. So if there is a risk of any adverse drug event side effects or anything or drug allergies, nobody questions because you've been told you trust the doctor and you don't question anything. Yes, trust the doctors because they have the technical knowledge they've been trained to do the work, but you have the right to get more information. So ask for that information. Two, the issue of going to Google is not the best way. It might not give you the actual evidence because everybody can post anything online. I can tweet now and it will be online and you can use that as a basis for your clinical indications or anything, your scientific diagnosis. It's not scientific because whatever I'm doing, unless I share, it, I back it up with scientific references, then it's not any solid thing. And that's why we're talking about the scientific and research findings being reported in journals and publications and even different the scientific, the scientific journals, publications, and booklets, and even books that are peer reviewed. So that's, a, that's the whole scope of why we need the right communication and what we need to communicate and how we need to communicate it now next. So in terms of the behavior change and health communication, which is a very component, important bit at this time, risk perception, if we see there's a risk of COVID-19, we'll take the precautionary measures as serious as we are. By the current moment, or even since the start of COVID, initially there was that risk perception and people were cautious. At this point, most people have even let down their guard and nobody's, not so many people are wearing their mask. And if they're wearing it, it's for the police. It's at the chin and instead of being covering their nose and the mouth. So those are issues that need to be addressed. Then we also want to reinforce positive behaviors. Positive behaviors that is healthy lifestyle, being mobile, doing physical activities and all that. We need to reinforce that. We need to communicate it as much as possible. We need to influence social norms. There are certain issues that are happening in our societies and we've made them a normal thing. We understand issues on, let's say, for example, the issue on teen pregnancies and all. People are not discussing sexuality and all that, yet we know people are having sex around in the communities without protection because it's not normal to even seek the contraceptive material. If we made it a normal discussion, people will have access to these services they have positive health outcomes, and that is a win for the whole community. So how do we bridge that gap by influencing the social norms to move from that? We all can acknowledge that there's been progress that has been made by AMREF International through their work in terms of fighting female genital mutilation. They had to influence communities, give an alternative path to right of passages from childhood to adulthood. What are the practices? Can we integrate the community? And if we can influence those social and cultural norms, we are going to influence behavior change, and that behavior change leads to positive health outcomes. Then we have increased availability of support and needed services. When we do communication, a number of issues that are affecting communities, we are mobilizing support for them. And when we mobilize that support for them, political support, financial support, it all comes to ensure they can access the services they need. Last year, we had the ICPD conference on SRHR, and when the conference ended, there are a number of NGOs, a number of multinational organizations that are coming into the space to see how to foster or improve access to the services. That is a win. And even the government took action. When we had in November 20th and 21st last year, the mental health conference in Kenya, that was a turning point that even the president instituted the task force on mental health. We had a report released last month. So these are advances that are being made because of this kind of behavior change, health communication, that there is a problem. We need to act on it. And when we're mobilizing resources, there's that kind of knowledge, the technical knowledge that's coming in, the financial resources, and the political goodwill. Because without either of those, we are not going to make advances in ensuring we attain the positive health outcomes that we need. Then we have to empower individuals to change or improve their health conditions. If we empower individuals to change or improve their health conditions, they take responsibility for their health. They take responsibility for the health of the people around them. And we have an entirely healthy society, which is socially responsible. I am keen on social responsibility because my health is not only my health. It's my health and your health. And when I'm taking care of myself, I take care of the person next to me. And he also does, or he or she does take care of the person next to them. So it's a cripple effect of positive behavior change 
that has positive health outcomes for the entire society, which is productive. So how do we do it? There are different channels. We all know scientific conferences, town hall meetings, publications, articles can be written, media briefs and press releases through the media, group discussions, and such kind of webinars where we come together and discuss a number of issues we present on them. We help people probe and see how can we apply this kind of information. Then there is the audience profiling and targeting. How you do your communication is key in terms of you need to know your audience. You need to target that message to meet their particular interest. For example, if you're talking to the public who are already hungry because they did the loss, some lost their jobs and all, and you're telling them you have to keep, stay at home. Nobody can stay at home. And even there's yesterday, there's a tweet that I was thinking through a number of topics and reading on. The quality, quality attributed, the quality adjusted life years, yes, the quality adjusted life years and the, the disability adjusted life year DALI, D A L Y. So, quality adjusted life years and the disability adjusted life years, people are not sick, but they are exposed to an infection. It's a disability in the psychological sense that you have a risk of being, in, in being infected, but you have to weigh it on a scale of would I rather die of hunger? or die, get infected with COVID and get cured, because it's not even every other person that's dying. So these are some of the things that we have to communicate to and understand that audience. This is what they're dealing with. These are the challenges. And if I'm going to tell them this information, how will they take it based on their circumstances? It's very important. And that is even in terms of the costing that were put in place initially by the government. If you're telling me that if I report that I'm suspecting I'm infected, I'll have to go on quarantine with under my own cost, and even paying my rent for that month has been a problem, then why would I take myself to the quarantine facilities? It means I'm risking exposing every other person in my environment. So what does your audience expect or what are their challenges and what their features? Then how do we ensure that messaging is meeting their particular need? The outcome is focused with a call to action. What do you expect of your people to do? Like for this particular session that we're having, my main goal is that at the end of this, discussion, you as an individual, any health communication, health information that crosses your path, you have to question it. Because if you're not questioning that information, it might be fake news and it's going to influence how other people behave. It might be going to influence how another person behaves, yet it would have been changed if you made the right intervention at the right time. And to when you're a professional and you're someone you have an influence, you may not have an influence in a thousand people but influence two people or one person who trusts you and believes in you, then you can make that person change how they perceive this information and how they respond to taking care of themselves. That's a win for you as an individual and that is a win for that one person. That one person changed the whole narrative when you're talking about it in terms of the scale of impact. So the aim is you have to live here by knowing that health communication is key, you have a role to play in it. And that role is by ensuring when you're sick, you seek the right information, Anybody seek from your community, they seek the right information and probe for more so that they get better understanding. They don't self-diagnose. If they take the precautionary measures on social behavior change around any of the prevailing circumstances around us, as serious as it should be, and ensure they are abiding by them and doing what they feel is, they believe is right. Not even feeling, but believing is right because they know what's right. And your feelings might be lying to you at one point in time, but you have to know what you rationally and logically think of as right is always right and it should be right at that point so you have to do that then what is the basis what authority do you have to make such kind of a presentation the argument is there proof of evidence and that is something that was questioned by the video that i had earlier mentioned on covid19 the lady that was making making claims that hydroxychloroquine was working against covid and all that none of her findings were published in any paper the hospital that she's talking about is not listed among the people taking care of COVID-19. So what do, what do we have to trust about the claims that she's making? What evidence is there? So if you have no basis, no proof of evidence for what you are trying to present to the public or present to individuals, then you're misleading them. It's not that she did it and we do are not convinced. A number of people were convinced and even people went into buying them. And it's not only her. At the outset of COVID-19, there were issues about hydroxychloroquine being floated even by the US president, Donald Trump. And when this happened, there are a number of people who trust him. And when we do trust him, it will influence how we behave. 
our politicians in the local context not doing the right thing when they know there's no evidence against it not like attacking them. It means it influences every other person in the community. They have a responsibility, but are they playing by the rules? Are they doing what really needs to be done? It's our responsibility to ensure. We have a basis, we have an argument, and we will seek evidence to justify most of the scientific claims that we are making. If we can't get any scientific evidence, we need to ask. And this makes it very critical at this point even now. At the outset of COVID, people are wearing masks. And even now, people still have, some are wearing it the wrong way. For example, the surgical mask, there is the blue one, blue side and the white side. Because there was an, a, a fake kind of meme that moved around and everything, that you have the blue out to protect the other people when you are sick. You have the white out to protect yourself when you are not sick. Well, it's not the case because the blue one should be out and the white one should be in because of the different materials that are used in having the layers of the mask. So if that communication gets to the wrong person, you'd be having a mask like kind of a decoratory tool on your nose and mouth, but it's not protecting you. You are at risk of being infected. You are at, everybody around you is at risk because we don't have the right information. And yet, such kind of fake news or uncensored information reach every other person with ease. What if we could have a number of individuals who are doing the right thing and communicating what really needs to be communicated when it needs to be done to ensure we have a so, like kind of a society that's looking out for the right information and a health community it would be far much better. Then in terms of the presenter, authority, the credibility and the reliability. Whether trained or not trained, whether politician or not a politician, we have different influence in our society. And that is why the issue of politicians moving around has had a great kind of attention because there are people who the society trust, the people they have their people who look up to them. And when these people look up to them, whatever they say is taken as gospel truth. And this even puts much more pressure on individuals who are looked up in the society. For example, if you're a medical practitioner, everybody sees you in a hospital where you work, they see you as a doctor. And as a doctor, you are a respected member of the society, you have a responsibility, you have, they trust you with their lives and that's why they put you at a higher pedestal and you have to hold your bag in to be at that position. Holding your bargain to be at that position is ensuring you do the right thing and you look out for them because whatever you sell, they'll do it. And that is why for the video that was being presented, she's a doctor. If she's mentioned just a doctor, the general public will be in awe that now we have a doctor who is speaking for our needs because they expect a doctor to be looking out for them. And that is something that's very critical. And even for the people who are medical practitioners, the doctors in the house, you have to know that, for example, the scientific communication that I mentioned, a medical representative coming to present to you a case. If you make a decision that is biased, the society will depend on you to make the right decision for them. It means your single wrong decision because of the influence of the personal interest has an implication on the lives of every other patient that will come to you who will be receiving care that is influenced by that wrong decision that you made at a single point. So that will be that whole chain. And what happens is, as a professional, when you practice, Chances are, over time, you become a tenured professional, an expert, and people rely on your argument and your scientific professional judgment. So you'll even influence the junior doctors working under you. What would be the implication in the society? A society that is doing things that have already been influenced by one single mistake that you did because of your interest at that point. So you have to hold your bag and be on the higher pedestal where the society has put you to be and do what you believe is right. Because at the end of the day, even when you're we're talking about issues on corruption and all, you know when you want to be corrupt and you know when you're doing the wrong thing. It's not like something that just happens and you wonder why you did it and you didn't know it was corrupt. You know it before you do it. So before you get to do it, an error of commission, you'd rather avoid the whole thing. So making the right decision is very key. What are the current concerns? We have fake news being propagated, propagated every, by everyone everywhere because even me at some point you find like, I'm, really, I'm able to share some memes, and these memes, they might have med health related information. So how does it affect other individuals? There's the degradation of the sense of social responsibility. Everyone and everybody's looking out for their own well-being. An individual would pursue a particular interest because it has an, a way of financing their cost of living and everything. And that is what people are looking at. Would you ask yourself if you do it, if, you, if the circumstances change and you are the patient who needs to get the care? 
you are the lower party who needs to get the care that you're being influenced to do the wrong thing about. There's a loss of sense of social responsibility, and that is something that we need to nurture in our community. If I'm doing this thing because I know it's right for me, and it's right for every other person, then it will be cascaded down the line, and everybody leads a healthier life. Then there are issues on controversy that are coming up every other day. Even now, there are fights that are happening around issues on US and China around with regard to what we call it, the WHO funding. So when these issues are coming, what do we do? These controversies will influence even trust on the, these organizations. Mention if, for example, if I'm inclined to the USA and they're pulled out from WHO because they don't trust the body, then even my trust for the body goes. If my trust for the body entity goes, any communication that comes from them, whether scientifically proven, whether truthful, might not make sense to me. And if it doesn't make sense to me, it doesn't make sense to the people I'm interacting with who trust me. Am I not risking their lives? I am. So it means that these controversies as well, we have to be very critical on how we perceive them and how we respond to them. Then there are conspiracy theories. Even around COVID now, we have the issues on Google, Microsoft, and all that, using it for financial gains. Those are conspiracy theories. It's a disease and it's happening, and we have to find a way to get the solution. If we talk about issues that are not going to address the main problem as it is, we will be losing the whole point altogether. So we have to look at it from, a sub, from an objective view and look at what really is there in the society, what do we need to solve. And once we know what we want to solve, we move from that. Then the aspect on commercial interests, I've talked about it a number of times, but at the end of the day, we have to delink our professional and our social responsibility from their commercial interests. Do it because you need to do it and it's the right thing to do. Once you've done that, the commercial interests are normally there. Try to separate the two. Do what you, have, what you do to gain a living, a decent living, as everybody wants to have a decent living, but don't make that earning be at the expense of another individual. Who loses when you make that wrong decision? Who loses when you communicate the in negatively influenced health, health information, health facts? If it's the entire society, or even if it's one person, then that is not genuinely, or honestly earned money. It's not going to be the right thing for you to do. Avoid separating the commercial interests, which are normally there, from your social responsibility, your professional authority, and your task and responsibility to the entire society where you work. Next steps, take responsibility for what you commit, which have a health implication. For everything that you're telling someone, if it has an implication on their health, take responsibility for it. And imagine if that same communication that was being relayed was being relayed to you when you didn't have the information. What would you do about it? And how would you feel? So put yourself at the center of it and ensure you're doing what you feel is right if it were done to you when the, when the turns change. Seek facts and reliable information on health matters. Look for credible sites and resources. Healthcare providers who are in the house uphold ethical professional code of practice. Every profession within the healthcare sector has a code of practice. Abide by that and do what you know it needs to be done. Let go of every other influences that are there. We are in part of the society as we talked about the aspect on having ritualistic component of communication. We, have, we are part of a society and that society influences how we behave, how we do our things. But at the end of the day, the very society expects so much of you. So you have to ask yourself, are you going to meet the demands of that society? Or are you going to do what you believe is right at a particular level? And when you do what's right, you can influence that society to take another turn to do the right thing in that con context. Then another thing, the companies to abide by the professional code of practice. When we're talking about claims of pharma companies influencing research and all that, it's because they're not doing what they should, should be right. And that's why it's being hidden. So if they abide by those code of practices, that would be a win for everyone. And even in terms of the interaction with healthcare practitioners and all, and that is something that I would mention that I'm proud of the company I work for, the Kenya Association of Pharmaceutical Industry, because there's a code of practice that guides how our member companies and their medical representatives will interact with healthcare practitioners. There are no incentives in terms of gifts and all that. And when this don't happen, the commercial interest is limited. I won't say totally removed, but limited. And we should champion for more and more pharma companies to be part of such organizations that have disciplinary measures to ensure these commercial interests don't influence the care that patients receive and the professionalism of healthcare practitioners. 
then influential persons to exercise their social responsibility as leaders, I mentioned that. Then we have to call out bluffs and question and censored narratives which are being peddled to us. If someone comes out with a claim that something is working, yet there is no scientific evidence in a published or peer-reviewed journal somewhere, we have to ask. And when we do ask, we are going to win the issue about fake news and health communication that is not serving a purpose that is positive for the society, but serving individual interests or moving about with conspiracy theories. That would be a win for everyone. And thank you so much for being part of the discussion. I will send it back to you, Hezron. Yeah, th so thank you so much, David, uh, for the great insights. Um, I'm sure that you all learned something out of it. So right now we are going to get into questions. And I can see there's one question by Silvanas Manyala. So I'll just read it out to you, David. Uh, hi, David. What would be your advice on how to tackle the infodemic uh, during this COVID-19 era, especially when handling with the uninformed public, our friends and relatives being culprits as evidenced by the numerous WhatsApp uh, forwarded text messages and TikTok videos of self-proclaimed experts without being repulsive or appearing to be arrogant. The science already is too technical for them to understand. Uh, I don't know what would, be, what would be a response for that. Meanwhile, you can keep your questions coming. Thank you so much, Hezron, for the question. And thank you, Sylvanas, for asking. There's too much information that's coming out around COVID-19. And when that information is coming, as I mentioned, we have a gullible society. Everybody will get the information. And what we look out for is what serves my need at that particular point in time. And everybody wants to be an expert, as you mentioned self-proclaimed experts. We have so many experts around COVID-19, yet COVID didn't even exist. And meaning, even in my training as a pharmacist, the way I've been trained, there was no COVID that was mentioned in it, the COVID-19 one that we're talking about. So when you're handling such kind of a situation, is you come from a point of realizing that these people want to believe this information because they already feel they're at risk. And they feel like they want, they're actually holding on the only hope they have like, for example, the person who was sending the video on hydroxychloroquine and everybody. Everybody wants a cure for COVID. And when everybody wants a cure, whatever it is that you're told to be the cure for it, everybody will want to go for that. So that is the reason behind it first. So once you know that is the reason, look at it from their perspective of you want a cure, but there's no cure. What if it doesn't work for you? Because there is even, even from that point of information, some are not getting cured from that drug. So move it from their perspective and look at how you can bring them closer to you so that they see the sense out of it. One, this information is already out there. You think uh, there's a keyword, there's something that's about it. What do you want? You want to be healthy, and that's why you're concerned about getting a keyword. What if you abide by the health prevention measures that are in place, hand washing, social distancing, and all that? Once they've adopted those first, tell them, even, even malaria has a cure, but people still die of malaria. There's, there's there are drugs for HIV, and there are people who take them for life, and some even don't even want to imagine they're going to take those medicines. So it doesn't mean that a cure being there is going to help you. So move it from their point perspective, and then from their perspective, make them see the sense in your argument. If that happens, you'll be bridging the gap between you being a professional and expert who has the facts, and them being individuals who have li limited scientific knowledge or health literacy, and they get to understand what you are communicating with them. And I think that is something that I've tried with a number of my friends, and it's gaining traction a little bit because some of them feel like you have the facts. I don't have all the facts. I'm not an expert around COVID-19. But what I know is the disease is there factually. It is in place, and we have to avoid getting infected. That is the first thing. And in case you're infected, you need to be managed. How are you going to be managed? Leave that to the experts. Don't self-prescribe and all that. So move from their perspective to solve them, to bridge the gap in terms of ensuring we have limited information. Two, when such information gets to some discussion group, you have a responsibility to flag it up so that maybe it can be deleted in that group so that not every other person will have access to it. That's one. Two, you as a person, you can stop transmitting such information. Because even some of us, you find I get some message and I forward it to another group. Then when I'm forwarding it, I already have questions about it, but I've already shared it again. So some will be influenced, some will 
not take it by it in. So for example, if I have a technical issue that is challenging to me, I want to get a discussion around it, I'll look for some of my friends that I know, this guy is kind of objective in their view of different matters. So we can discuss the matter objectively. I'll call on his, call on Mike and a number of people, let's discuss this matter. Once we've discussed the issue, then even if I'm sharing it in another group, I know there's some kind of basis for it being of value. Other than that, you might send it in a group you think you have all the professionals. Professionals are from the society. So it means out of a 90%, out of 100%, 80% might be influenced by societal perception as well. So not everything that you think you're sharing within the professional groups will have the implication or the impact that you want it to gain. Some might be swayed, some might not be swayed. So you be critical in the people you share the same information with to have a, an objective discussion around it. I hope I've answered you, Salvanus. Is there another question, Hezron? So, Rogers, there's a question you've asked about what do what do as well as the other members think would be the best practical health communication intervention can be used to counter the issue of wearing masks? What do you as well as others members think? Okay. On the issue of wearing masks, we have to acknowledge that the masks are very important and they are going to protect us from getting infected, whether pre prevent us from getting infected and prevent other people we get to interact with from getting infected. But as a society, one, access to them is not as much. Some people don't still have access to them because of the financial costs or the implication on it. So we have to encourage people to wear masks. And wearing masks has to be the right way. The issue of wearing masks on their chin and everything is not right. But we can only do it when we as individuals, we're also doing the very thing. I can't tell you to wear your mask when I'm not having my mask on. I live in Kiambu County, and there are some places that I walk and nobody's having their mask on. And even when you look at it in terms of the interviews that we're having on TV and everything, media exposure, you have a politician coming in and having their mask on their chin because it's a show that they have a mask on. We need to start from it in a strategic manner and looking at, one, we need masks, which is key. And that mask is supposed to prevent you from getting infected or to prevent exposure to other people. Once we know that fact right, everybody has a responsibility to do it right do a demo on how it should be done, then let them do it. And if people are not doing it, we have to take responsibility by holding people accountable from not doing the right thing. For this aspect of having the mask on the chain, it's because of the police officers. You're doing it because you feel like you'd be arrested. And even the police officer coming to arrest you doesn't have a mask, or if they have a mask, they're having it on their chain as well, like the same way like you did it. Or if you didn't have a mask there for them, they have it on the chain. Does it help? Why do we need the mask? We have to communicate from the perspective of we have to wear the mask to prevent us from getting infection. So if we know the reason as why we are putting on the mask, then that's going to help us in knowing how we need to put it on. But if we don't know the why of doing having the mask on, it will just be a theory and we don't even know how to put it on right. So let people know why they need to put it on. Let them know how they want to put it on and then let them put it on and let everyone be held accountable when they are doing it or not doing it. But the aspect of having some doing it right, some not doing it, not communicating why, and then we have an aspect of threat. And that is why people are having it on the chain. It's just a threat so that I don't lie, I don't end up in prison. But is it the reason that you need to have the mask or not to end up in a prison or to prevent yourself from getting infected? I think that is very critical and we have to start by doing what we need, feel is right from our own perspective. If I'm putting on my mask in the right way, if I'm working with someone, they'll definitely be looking at doing it the right way. And I'll also mention it to them, by the way, your mask is not the way it should be. They put it on the right way. That is a win because I've protected myself, I've protected the next person. And we have to have the discussion and even encourage more people. So that is one thing, I think. Then Android, there's a, okay, a very healthy talk. Communication is a major issue in families and societies. How can all be rich? How can all be reached maybe through Nyumbakumi, the structure to reach all? The Nyumbakumi is yes, there were sound plans that were in place in, through the Nyumbakumi. There's a, even now in the, with COVID-19, there was a community engagement mechanism. In the community engagement mechanism, there's the youth groups, there is the general group for health communication and all. 
but there is no structured engagement plan. So you find, for example, I could mention in some of the forums that we are in, you're told you're part of the community engagement mechanism. As a culture team, we have our initiatives to reach out to community and sensitize people, which we do. But is it structured? Who is taking responsibility? And what are the criteria of how to do it? You report as in different organizations that are working on the ground, and then that is being compiled without no guidance on what needs to be done, how it needs to be done. I think there's someone that needs to take responsibility and know our health communication should be in this manner. These are the key essentials of why we need to communicate. These are the components that we need to communicate about and to the people. Then once we know this is why we need to communicate, this is what needs to be communicated, then we bring on board how to get it to the very people, the Nyumbakumis, as you're mentioning. They, we have them in place and let them know what they need to communicate, not the aspect of having every other organization coming on board with their own communication strategy to keep on doing the work. They keep on doing the work, they're reaching out to so many people, but how, how accurate are their information that they're sharing out? How consistent is it? Because even the consistency is an issue. When we have, today we are saying this is the right thing, tomorrow we say something totally different, we confuse the masses. And as already had been mentioned by Sylvanas, there's so much technical information, and even as healthcare workers, the guidelines that are being released. Imagine somebody sending you a document that is 250 pages large, and you should be really able to read it, censor that information, and use it in making clinical judgments. How long should you read a 250 book page, book guideline? We need to get that information in a structured manner such that it's as brief as it should be, and it should be specific on giving you what you really need to make that intervention. If it doesn't happen that way, we'll have lost it. And I hope as members of this group where we are having this chat now, we can start using our forums where we are to bring such kind of insights. How do we ensure they're structured? How do we ensure it gets to the people who need that information? Then when it's happening, we are moving a step ahead. Then there's another question from James. James, what case excels the society in taking care of the psychological trauma related to and reliable information? Currently, I don't think there's so much of care, psychological care, psychological trauma care that is being offered, except for the one from Red Cross. That is 1192, if I'm not wrong, but you could just check the toll-free number, 1191. So for them, the, what they offer is, if you have any concern that you need support on, you can call the number, you'll get connected to a psychologist or a counselor who will listen to you and give you guidance on whether the information is not right or wrong, and if it's actually right and you feel like already it's not the best information that you'd want to hear, they take you through the process. And that is what's happening from their perspective. I can say for the Red Cross one, because I have a friend who have tried it and it has worked. And the, the, the connection to a certified individual who gave the right care was there. Because from their feedback, you know whether it's achieving its goal or not. So I think that is a better way to go about it. But as a society, we also have to ask the government, because when we're talking about psychotherapy support, we are having mental health task force reports that are being released. How are we using that information to ensure we are getting access to the care? Because if we have so many guidelines in place, the books will not treat us. Like the documents that are being filed, they're not going to give you care when you're stressed. You need people who are empowered to offer the care. And when they're empowered to, get the, to offer the care, they need to be linked to you for you to get access to that care. So we need to start from, we need the care, the guidelines are in place and everything. Who are the people to offer that care? Are they empowered to offer that care? Are they available for us to get the care? Then if those are answered, then we are in a better position. Is there an option for people who seem allergic to the mask material? For now, I don't think there's an option, but then there are different types of materials that are being used for masks. Cecilia? There are some, I know the ones that we are having, the surgical masks. Some are not of the right material, that's for sure as well. So these are some of the quality measures that need to be put in place. So some might not be the ideal ones, some are good. So it's a matter of knowing which works for you and which doesn't work. Then if you find the one that works for you, you, start, you stick to that and avoid that exposure. Or even, for example, if you're allergic to a number of them, you could reduce the risk of having to use it a number of times. Let's say if you are having your employment and all, you can make a local arrangement so that you work a number of days and have another a number of days off so that you reduce your risk of exposure or even have work half day at the station, another period off work so that you don't have to have them on because 
with allergic reactions to such kind of social contact materials, let's say the fabric, it's a matter of the number of contacts. So if you have less contact with that material, the allergy reaction reduces as well. So you could work around that. Prune, how best can we communicate to avoid conflict with the government position on a particular health matter, i.e. case between the US and hydrochloroquine case? Communicate. There's a, there's a conflict of communication between the government and partic on particular health matters with the health professionals. And this is because everybody, as Sylvanas mentioned, is becoming an expert on COVID. We are not experts on COVID. And two, there's that scientific background that you have that should be guiding you in terms of making particular decisions. So it's a matter of the government aligning with the health professionals. The problem that we have, we have a government that is politically motivated, and because of the political motivation in the government, you want to stand out to be right. So nobody wants to be wrong. You can make a wrong commit to come to comment, comment Leo, and you want to hold on to that same comment tomorrow and the day after tomorrow because you don't want to accept that you're wrong. We have to acknowledge that at some point we make mistakes, we, fa we fail to know the right thing, and when we fail to know the right thing, we have to accept, then look at the best solution that's going to sort other people's problems. Because if we don't, they are meant to mess up. And even in our government, there are issues that we're having about conflicting communication. We are being told, like, go to Mbagazi and all that, go get tested, there are mass testing and everything. You go to a testing facility, as I mentioned in one of our sessions, personally, I went on 4th of July to be tested. Going to be tested, we are over 50 people at the station, and only 20 could be tested. So these 30 exposed themselves coming to the testing facility and exposed themselves again going home. Are we doing the right thing? There's conflicting information. We have to align to know this is our capacity because we understand their challenges in getting even the testing materials. And this is our capacity. This is how much we can go. And we are trying as much as possible to cope with the situation. Let's abide by doing what we feel is justified and that what's right. Then once that is done, we are avoiding this conflicting information because somebody wants to be superior on other things. And even some of our healthcare practitioners, some are influenced in a particular way as well. So we have to be sober in mind and be objective in terms of our responsibility to the society, especially at this point of the pandemic, and everybody is not having the best of moments. So if they are not having the best of moments, the best we can do is lessen the tough moments they are going through. And that is what we can do. I hope that answers you, Trun. Through the government structure, such as Chief political leaders, don't get to see the necessity or importance. The government structures could work, but we have a government structure that is detached from its very people. And that is why I feel the main solution that could help, help us solve our, most of our problems as a country, political governance, even social problems is being part of the process. And that can start from community mobilization. You and me, where we are, we can get involved in the government issues. We can drive an agenda so that we know this is what we need. For example, if someone is politically influenced, we get someone who knows. We want to get you to run for this position. If you're running for that position, these are the things that need to be addressed. Not a matter of someone coming, let's say, for example, during the campaigns, somebody promising us 10 stadiums in five years. Do we really need stadiums when we're staying hungry? So these are some of the things that we, be, let's drive the agenda and look at what really needs to happen in the community level. And that is where we have the development and participatory communication. Let's design our solutions, involve the government in designing that solution, and ensure it's something that has been taken up to be implemented, rather than having it top-down model, because that is what has been happening. Thank you so much. Any question? If not, I think the session would come to an I end. I'll hand over to Hezron. I think you're done with the questions now. It's just... Um... Uh, you guys are saying great discussion. Thank you, David, for the informative session. So I think we've all learned something about communication in healthcare and something that you're going to put into practice. So I'll just leave you guys with a quote today, uh, which says, uh, the biggest communication problem is we do not listen to understand. We listen to reply. And that was said by Stephen Covey. And as we end the session today, uh, I'm giving you a challenge that um, you should be listening to understand what people are saying and instead of just listening to reply to reply what they're saying. Yeah, and if there's someone else here who's just raised their hand, 
Uh, I don't know if you have a question. That's Paul, 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 phone number. It's okay, you can answer the question. You can raise it. Paul, are you there? Paul? I think maybe probably it was just a, a mistake. So I think I think you're good to go now. Thank you so much. So uh, yeah, I'd like to say thank you all for joining us today, and also for the participants on Facebook. Thank you so much for also joining us, and we are going to share the video online on YouTube so that you can at least share with your colleagues so that they can learn something from it. And yeah, have a good evening and have a good week ahead of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, everyone who joined in. Those on Zoom, those on Facebook Live, we really appreciate having you on board. Thank you.